I still can't believe that, after all this time, my dream has come true. That I, along with a good friend, am flying off to Putarana Plateau. Ever since I was a child, I have dreamt of visiting this magical land and coming upon those mysterious animals people call bloodthirsty killers. In my heart, I don't believe the stories about them, and I was desperate to prove that these myths, as they seemed to me, were unfounded. Why the Putarana Plateau, this unfamiliar land about which we know so little? Clearly, there are more accessible places in Siberia to find such creatures. However, it is only here, on Putarana, that they are so unacquainted with man and his cunning nature. This proved the crucial factor in choosing the right place. Will we get lucky and manage, in the chaos of the mountains and the incredible architecture of the valleys and rocks, to find these dangerous beasts and to befriend them? We have no idea at the moment. Finally, we have landed. A world covered by snow, this will be our home for the next nine months. As there is nobody else around for hundreds of kilometers, everything will depend on us alone, our knowledge, experience, and skills. Emergency help will not be forthcoming. <laughs> This is it. Now we are alone. Can it be true that I'm about to live out my old dream? Or perhaps this is really a dream from which I will soon awaken. We are not novices in wandering around the north, and we know only too well what it means to spend winter in the taiga without reliable shelter. That is why last summer, when preparing for our future expedition, we built a small house in the heart of the Putarana Plateau, right next to Lake Ayan. Most importantly, the house has to be in a good condition. The freezing cold here is nothing to joke about. Fortunately for us, bears and wolverines, the local bandits, have passed by the house without demolishing it, which often happens with hunters' lodges in the Siberian taiga. Finding our winter dwelling to be in good order, we hurry to complete our domestic chores and retreat from the impending cold into our wooden lair. <laughs> Fourth of March, ten AM. It is minus forty degrees outside. On our first day, we were visited by neighbors, and how glad we were to see them. Siberian jays were the first to show up. Every morning, they delight us with their loud voices and are rewarded with generous edible tips. 
Their singing is similar to a parrot's tweet, although the surrounding world doesn't remind us of the tropics. And here is our second neighbor. It is not so amiable. A nimble stoat lodges unglamorously beneath our house and carefully regulates the contents of the rubbish bin. We don't enjoy all of his activities, especially at night. Nevertheless, it wouldn't be right to kick the scamp out for such small tricks. We spent two days organizing our household. All the domestic chores are finished and now we're ready to explore the surrounding environment, to learn more about what lives here and to find out if there are indeed any wolves at all. Perhaps we've settled here for nothing. The surrounding region is totally unfamiliar to us. To begin with, we decide to explore the territory around the house. At least the trails will help us develop an initial impression of the place. As we set off, the fluffy snow becomes our trusted ally. On its surface lie the footprints of all the local inhabitants, ptarmigans, arctic foxes, hares. These arctic residents are perfectly camouflaged. In this kingdom of snow, their white color gives them a greater chance of survival. Against this white backdrop, they are only noticeable when they move. Standing motionless, they disappear from view. Совсем недавно прошел. В сторону озера пошел. Наверное, след матерого волка. Такой тяжелый лапы тащит за собой. А вот еще один след от нас недалеко. Где? The wolf's footprints are fresh and are located not far from the house. This means we didn't make a mistake in choosing this place as our base. There are wolves here, and now we have to find them without becoming their prey. Inspired by our findings, we decide to climb the nearest hill to observe the world around us from above. It would seem that now, with the taiga bare and everything exposed, it should be easy to spot the wolves against the white backdrop. Already quite tired, we try to distinguish any movement whatsoever. But around us, there is nothing but a white, stillness. Now, as the snowy valley stretches out before our eyes, we are able to comprehend the enormity of the territory in which the wolves live and hunt. It will be hard to explore it thoroughly and especially difficult to find the wolves and their dens. However, we just have to accept this fact and begin investigating this frozen world one step at a time. The wolverine is a sneaky, persistent and strong predator. It does not hibernate and instead wanders around the taiga in winter in search of food. If a hunter's winter hut happens to be in its way, 
a wolverine will muster up all its strength to climb inside and destroy it. The animal is widely found on Putarana Plateau and has almost no enemies. Twentieth of March. Two weeks have passed since we settled in the valley. Pusta. Nikawo ni vidna. Nothing has attacked us and torn us to shreds, nor pursued us. The wolves haven't been demonstrating any signs of aggression. For this reason, we refuse to carry a rifle with us, as it would be nothing more than a dead weight. Meanwhile, we've seen many wolf footprints and territorial marks, and several times we've heard their discordant howls. It would seem that not only a couple, but a whole pack of wolves, perhaps five or six in number, live in our immediate vicinity. However, we've yet to catch a glimpse of them. Может быть, это же на рай их валера. На, посмотри. Я не знаю, что делать. Пойти подняться, мы наследим. It's great luck to discover a wolf's den in the taiga. Now we'll definitely come face to face with the wolves. In order to avoid disturbing the creatures, we decide to forget about this route to the den for the next two months, especially given that the ice makes it fairly dangerous to walk along. We'll wait until the end of May, when the wolves give birth to cubs. It's now April, and the reindeer migration season is fast approaching. We're preparing ourselves to meet them, and there's no better place to watch the reindeer than the northernmost tip of Lake Ayan. Here, the lake turns into a bottleneck, forming a narrow thoroughfare along which the reindeer will no doubt travel. In early April, a primordial instinct leads reindeer to leave their winter pasture lands in Evenkia and start traveling northwards. And we are lucky enough to observe the group in the vanguard, with around 300 trailblazers slowly walking over the lake. They are only the first of thousands in this migration, which will serve as the valley's most beautiful spectacle from now until the end of May. Presently, only females and youngsters are on the move, whilst the males remain in the south. They will be the last to travel this journey. As the reindeer arrive in the valley, migratory wolves also appear. In contrast to resident wolves, these animals lead nomadic lives, effectively trailing the reindeer as they migrate. They are usually solitary animals. As they enter territory patrolled and occupied by local resident wolves, they are timid and move carefully 
and stealthily. As such, it's clear we will not be able to make contact with them. Валера, волки пришли. Opposite our house, around 200 meters away, we glimpse a couple of wolves, a male and a pregnant female, walking leisurely along. Their relaxed behavior suggests that they are a local couple. It was probably these wolves' footprints that we discovered on our first day in the valley. The wolves sniffed around, marked their territory, searched for mice and occasionally looked our way. It was a demonstration of their evident fearlessness and our first face-to-face -face meeting with them. Is this possibly the first step towards a future friendship? We were full of hope. Spring in Putarana brings frequent stormy weather. Severe snowstorms don't frighten us, as we are sitting in warmth and comfort. <laughs> However, they pose a huge challenge to wild animals, sometimes even resulting in death. Predators use such weather conditions to hunt. The snowstorm only calmed down three days later, and life in the valley resumed again as if from a clean slate. In the valley's narrowest region lie the remains of a savage reindeer. We don't approach it. Instead, we construct a primitive hiding place and start observing in the hope that the hunter will return to finish off his feast. The first to appear is a wolverine. Acting somewhat strangely, it approaches the reindeer extremely cautiously, dodging, glancing around, clearly frightened. Instead of feasting on the carcass, the wolverine tears off the reindeer's leg, like a true professional. Its movement is precise, perfect, and the leg is broken off almost immediately. And just in the nick of time too, in the distance a new actor appears on the scene. And the wolverine rapidly disappears into the forest with the reindeer's leg. When you steal, it is foolish to display any bravado. Instead, you always have to be on your guard. In the wild, that is the first rule of nature's survival code. A wolf approaches the place of the reindeer's demise, cautiously, sniffing about and glancing from side to side. For some reason, the wolf does not approach the carcass, merely taking a piece of the reindeer's hide before retreating back into the forest. It's possible it caught a whiff of a strange smell and wishing to avoid any conflict, decided to continue along his way. 
it seems to be a migratory wolf, and the wolverine is therefore incredibly fortunate. This means its feast will continue for several days. In these parts, bears usually wake from their hibernation around the beginning of May. This year, however, owing much to the early thaw, the master of the taiga has awoken in April. On leaving its lair, this lumbering beast travels along the river in the hope of stumbling upon some melted fish or carrion. Nonetheless, bears are not averse to occasionally combining their nutritional rations with some fresh meat. But in order to catch a reindeer, the bear has to first become a sprinter and the young are inexperienced in this. Oh well, not a big issue. Things will become warmer after the winter hibernation. The 20th of May. Visible changes are underfoot in the wild, particularly with the reindeer's migration. One can feel the increasing warmth in the air. It is a signal to the males. We notice their arrival immediately. The deer's heads are covered with small velvety lumps. These are velvet antlers, young shoots, which eventually develop into magnificent adult antlers. However, this future branching is yet to come, and for now there is a distance of thousands of kilometers to travel. Who knows what fate has in store for these wanderers of the north on their long journey. They need to find a way of surviving before autumn arrives. It is the end of May. Spring quickly wipes the white snow of winter from the mountain slopes. It has been over two months since we first attempted to establish contact with the local wolves. Since then, we have discovered where their den is located. We have also come across some migratory wolves. We know that the local family consists of five wolves, which we were able to spot from a distance, playing on the lake. One day, early in the morning, a wolf paid us a visit, approaching the bait we had specifically placed on the opposite bank of the river. Our house's proximity, our footprints, and scent did not seem to worry him. The wolf quietly ate, hid a few morsels of food, marked its territory, and headed back towards the den. It was almost certainly our old friend the wolf we saw together with the female a month ago. But this time he was alone. Where was his mate? In all likelihood, this wolf couple has already had cubs and are now tied to this one region. As such, it's time for us to return to their den. The most exciting and long-awaited day of our expedition has arrived. How will the wolves react to our appearance? Will they attack us? No doubt they will protect their young, and then we'll be in trouble. Despite knowing the possible dangers ahead, we nevertheless refuse to carry a rifle with us, choosing instead to take only some sala and flares. If we get into trouble, we can climb a tree and simply wait out the danger. During the nesting period, female ptarmigan completely change their feathers and are almost impossible to see in their nests. The birds know this and leave the nest only when danger becomes inescapable. 
we spend the first half of the day observing their lair. There is silence all around us. Nothing moves. The excitement overwhelms us and we decide to approach the open hole. Интересно, что далеко уходит. Первый зал, то второй. Now that the den appears empty, the link connecting us closer to the wolf family has been broken. We need to find their other lair, and fast, before the cubs grow up and leave the den. We know one rule which wolves always follow. They always build their homes near water. As their cubs need a lot to drink, and wolves are unable to transport water back and forth. As such, our first step is to explore the areas around the permanent rivers and lakes. We have begun a new search in the territory around the located den. This is genuine wolf country. We find one old one and three perfectly suitable wolf dwellings. However, they are all empty. We walk further and further into the taiga in search of the lair, and in so doing make some interesting discoveries that confirm the active lives of the nearby wolves. Everywhere around us we find wolf tracks, droppings, fur, gnawed deer bones, and even the remains of wolves themselves. With each new discovery, it becomes clearer that we are getting closer to the wolves. Very soon we'll find an inhabited den. However, our expectations remain distinct from the reality. The taiga holds on tightly to its secrets. The 10th of July. The days are flying by. We continue searching new corners of the valley. Occasionally, on examining a creek or canyon, we find ourselves in areas where a wolf's den cannot possibly be. Nevertheless, we open up wonderful new worlds of rocks, birds and waterfalls. Rare and endangered birds nest here. The gear falcon is one, a breed whose nests are extremely difficult for ornithologists to track down. They build these nests in the bays of steep cliffs, using them for many years and abandoning them only when they begin to become uncomfortable. Buzzards are not so interested in comfort. A rocky ledge is enough for them to build their nests, constructing a perch on them in the form of sacks. They continue reconstructing and adding structure to these nests each year until they fall from the cliff. Buzzards and gear falcons usually position their nests on the southern side of the canyon. Sunlight is not an issue for these bright young chicks. However, for black raven chicks, it can be deadly. As a result, ravens usually build their nests in the shaded parts of the cliffs or in deep bays.
Of course, these birds fascinated us, but their airborne lives were firmly hidden from view by the steep mountain cliffs. Therefore, we spent much of our trek absorbed by the life around the waterways. Every river and mountain stream here has its own waterfall, each with its own unique beauty, height and strength. Because of its unusual topography, the Putarana Plateau has one of the highest densities of waterfalls in the world. Most of them are located here, on the plateau surface. In the spring and summer, after heavy rain, their number increases a hundred times over. These waterfalls are so fascinating that it is impossible to turn one's glance away from their running waters. Every day adds its own unique touch to their appearance. Like flowers in the spring, they come to life, grow rapidly, bloom around early summer, before fading in the autumn while still enchanting with their evolving beauty. One can enjoy them all year round. Today, most of the Putarana Plateau is protected by the Putaranski Nature Reserve, which is included in the list of UNESCO World Natural Heritage Sites. This is one of the largest reserves in the country, with an area of around 20,000 square kilometers. The 5th of August. The search for a new den comes to a dead end. It is a mystery. Some of the wolves' traces remain, but their owners are nowhere to be seen. We sense that we may be chasing ghosts. Our daily roving in the taiga is proving extremely exhausting, and we're ready to give up. These well-trodden paths lead away from the stream and up the slope, scattered with cub droppings, they deliver us to the ruin of some large rocks. Surrounding these stones is more fresh droppings, fur and bony remains. Everything suggests the cubs have enjoyed a good long stay here. Thoroughly exploring the area, we find nothing resembling an entrance to a den. It is likely the wolves left this place just days ago. We have arrived too late. September arrives unnoticed. 
Winter will soon dawn on the region and along with it the reindeer will return and the wolves will be set into motion. Our main goal, to develop an acquaintance with the local wolves, has not been achieved. We still hope that when the reindeer return we will get lucky. Meanwhile, charmed by the Indian summer, we immerse ourselves in a forest fairy tale and enjoy the beauty and generous gifts of a golden autumn. Early October and snow engulfs the Ayan Valley, ptarmigan, hares and arctic foxes are now dressed in winter coats and blend into the landscape. Only their trails betray their presence. Nature has deprived the sable of a white coat and we spot one in the distance, hunting by the river. Seeing us, the robber grabs his prey and runs like an arrow into the woods, hiding up a tree. The Putarana is the northernmost limit of the Sable's territory. As such, not many of these cute little animals dwell here. Winter truly arrives at the end of October. We are considerably tired of being alone. We already want to escape this snowy prison and head straight back into urban life. But it is too early to think of home, as our main goal has yet to be achieved. Our long-awaited reindeer appear at the beginning of November, when the frost begins to reach below minus 30 degrees. Their autumn migration contrasts sharply with their spring migration. Now the animals move in mixed herds. As a rule, a herd consists of 10 to 20 females and several males, among which there is a dominant bull, the hor. Wearing the largest antlers and with a long silver beard hanging from his neck, the hor constantly keeps watch over his herd and defends the females from any attempted attacks. With the appearance of the reindeer, our optimism returns. It should be that the local wolves are stirred into action, following them close behind. But our joy proves premature. Already on the third day, the migration diminishes sharply in size, with the reindeer ceasing to move at all soon after this. We no longer expect the wolves to appear, and so call an end to our expedition. We return from our final expedition. Closer to home, we meet our playful neighbor. Like a dog, he shows no fear, is always pleased to see us, and even lets us take him by the hand. Evidently, some wild animals are able to fully trust humans. However, wolves are not among them. They construct well-defined barriers for themselves, which they never cross under any circumstances unless by accident. Our wolves acted similarly, making it clear that we can never develop a bond with them, even if we were to settle here permanently. The November days shorten very quickly, and the cold intensifies just as rapidly. It is fast approaching the Arctic night, a time of frost and darkness. Almost every night, the sky above our house flashes with the glowing patterns of the northern lights. 
we go outside to enjoy this Arctic festival. The lights usually sparkle with shades of green, but sometimes we get lucky and witness other colors. Today is the 19th of November. We leave tomorrow. As a farewell visit, we head to Lake Ayan. This is the end of our story. My premonitions have proven correct. Now that we have lived alone with the wolves for almost a year, I can safely claim that wolves in their natural environment will never seek contact with man, let alone attack him. In my mind, the myth of the bloodthirsty murderers has been shattered forever. Frozen in motion, we stop to enjoy the enchanting song of the mountains. And in that instance, we all lose ourselves in contemplation. But somewhere deep in our souls lies the hope that this thrilling, heartfelt howl will always ring out in this mountain region, and that next year the wolves' den, for now empty, will again be filled with the joyful barking of little wolf cubs. But alas, we will not be there to hear it.